All right, everybody, welcome to the Age of the Samurai. So this is one of the new series I have going on my channel, and it's going to work in conjunction with a couple other series I have planned on Japanese history and Japanese culture. And specifically in this video, well, this video series, what we're going to be looking at is the Age of the Samurai. We're going to be primarily focusing on the development of samurai honor culture, how that relates to modern Japanese state formation, medieval Japanese state formation, and, you know, I initially considered working this into the overall history of Japan series I have planned, but upon further reflection, I decided to, you know, kind of make it its own series, because to discuss the history of the samurai is really to discuss the history of Japan and vice versa, but it's such a massive topic and the literature on it is so massive and so diverse that it's probably better and it's probably easier to just have this be its own series and then have the History of Japan series, which I'm also doing, just work together to get to the same end goal. So, before we get into the development of samurai honor, samurai honor culture, what that means, samurai warfare, that kind of thing, I thought it would be maybe useful to talk about the historiography of the origins of the samurai, because... You know, we drop this word around samurai, samurai culture, bakufu, shogunate, all that stuff. What does that really mean? Where does it come from? So, if you are, you know, a Westerner, by which I mean if you live in Europe or America or an area highly impacted by those cultures, you are probably most familiar in terms of the development of warriors and the development of a warrior era with the medieval period and knights. Starting in the early 1800s, Japan is coming into more and more contact and more and more violent contact with the Western world. Eventually, in 1868, this results in the overthrow of the Bakufu, the last uh, samurai government, the Tokugawa shogunate, and the Meiji Restoration. The emperor now has, ostensibly, power in Japan again. Japan is trying to build their government along Western lines. They're highly impacted by Western culture, and in the process of that, they have this issue. Is it possible to be modern and to be Japanese? How do you balance the two? And in the process of attempting to balance the two, and in the process of attempting to show to the rest of the world that Japan can be Westernized, they start looking back through their history, and they're highly impacted by Western models of historical thinking, Western models of historiography, that kind of stuff. And through that lens, Meiji-era Japanese historians are looking at the samurai and the development of the samurai as akin to knights in medieval Europe. So, medieval Europe has knights, Japan has samurai. The basic short narrative kind of is, you know, the fall of Rome results in the Dark Ages. Well, there's violence because there's not really centralized authority, so the result is feudalism. Therefore, in early Japan, we have violence, from which you get war, and you need to solve this problem of war, so what do you get? You get the Western notion of feudalism. Same thing develops in Japan. The West has manners, Japan has shōin. the West has nobility, Japan has kuge and buke, so kuge are like the court aristocracy, these guys are, uh, you know, technically part of the nobility, but they are more concerned with the development of high culture, writing, literature, that kind of thing. Art, definitely. But they also have buke. Buke are also aristocracy. They're also nobility, but these are the warrior houses. Usually, not always, but usually, they're descended from the imperial family or another high-ranking body of kuge. Too many people, so they send a branch out into eastern Japan or western Japan to go fight. That's where the buke originate. West has chivalry. Japan is Bushido. So, you see where this is going. You see how kind of, you know, some Japanese historians could look at this period and be like, oh yeah, well, of course it matches up to medieval Europe. This is called the Western Analog Theory. Sometimes it's called the Western Thesis, or the European Thesis. It's largely been discredited, but I'm opening the video up with this. Because if you are at all familiar with the origins of the samurai, this is probably, to an extent what you're familiar with. So, in 645, the Japanese government has a problem. They have just gone through a coup, um, and now they need to strengthen their state. Well, how do you do this? You institute the Taika reform. So, that is basically taking the models of the Chinese Tang and Sui dynasties, saying, oh, this worked for the most powerful country on the mainland, China, 
let's implement this in Japan. So the result is the uh, Ritsu Ryo state. So Ritsu is the civil code, Ryo is the criminal code. So Ritsu Ryo. It's based on multiple different things in Chinese culture and Chinese governance. So in the process of implementing a Chinese method of developing a state in Japan, Japan not only comes into contact with Confucianism, yes, they already had contact with Buddhism, but it becomes more so. Uh, there are multiple methods of Chinese governance imported into Japan. The exam system never really becomes a thing, but Chinese writing and Chinese literature absolutely do. But one of the things we also get, and this is crucial for understanding the historiography of the samurai and where these people come from, is the Chinese method of raising a military. So, the Chinese method of doing this was conscription. Japan also implements this, and when Japan implements a conscription military, basically it's one in four men, one in four males, have to join the military as a soldier. You have approximately a month of active duty, a year active training. Uh, it's problematic, though, because there's not really like a central armory. You have to supply your own equipment. So, as you might expect, over the long term, having peasants do this is going to bankrupt a lot of families. And this has a lot of problems moving forward. Not only this, but they're peasant conscripts, so they're not necessarily like the best trained troops. Eventually, though, we move from the peasant conscriptions to a body of professional warriors, the samurai. So how does this happen? It's probably not an understatement to call the origins of the samurai extremely contentious. It calls into question, you know, any, any explanation of where these people come from calls into question numerous understandings and conceptions of early Japanese history and early Japanese state formation. And the standard view that, you know, samurai are akin to knights, they originate on Shoin, which is like a manner there's feudalism in early Japan, that kind of thing, the Western analog stuff. The standard view still originated and still comes from these two scholars, Kaneichi and Sansom. So any, uh, any historiographical essay of Japanese history, that is, you know, the, the study of Japanese history, how historians have conceptualized it in the past, ultimately is going to go back to Asakawa Kaneichi and George Sansom. These guys wrote two of the biggest, most well-known histories of Japan in the early 20th centuries. You can see over here, this white book, A History of Japan to 1334, is the first volume of George Sansom's trilogy. I don't know what the other two are, they're around here somewhere. Um, but my point is that these two scholars and the work they produced is so influential and has been so influential that their idea of where the samurai come from has basically been either accepted or slightly modified. So it's been accepted by people like Reishauer and Deuce and modified by people like Hall and Mass, all big names in the fields of Japanese history. So let's talk a little bit more about what this idea is. In the 10th century, so the 900s, and even a little bit before that, in the 800s, a little after into the 1000s, there's a lot of rebellions going on in Japan. Primarily, it's in the north, because that area is not fully conquered, it's not fully brought into the Japanese state. It also happens out west. The military fails, repeatedly. And this demonstrates, time and time again, the weakness of the Ritsuryu, that is, the Japanese state after the implementation of Chinese models, the weakness of that state and the weakness of that state's military. The response, according to Kaneichi and Sansom, is that, well, the military sucks, you can't depend on the army to actually protect the property of the nobles, so what do you do? The nobles build up their own land, at the expense of the government, and then they hire warriors to protect it. Hence, the samurai, they're hired swords, they're private warriors, and this makes sense, right? But, as we're going to see, this is much more complex, this is really too simple. So... To kind of sum things up with this, according to Kaneichi and Sansom, the origins of the samurai lie in the fact that, well, yeah, the court has, like, nominal authority over Japan. Uh, in practice, not so much. The court is very insular. It's very in uninterested in outside affairs. They're not really interested in running the country. They're more interested in the development and cultivation of Chinese culture. So they are very interested in, well, I'm a noble. I'm in, you know, Heian Kyo. My passion, my thing is 
painting, writing, uh, calligraphy, literature, the study of philosophy, Confucianism. This is the environment in which the tale of Genji, the world's first novel, was written. So, you know, stuff like that. The result, then, is that there's no control in the countryside. There's violence, there's war, how do you solve this? Feudalism. Um, and then by about 1100, warriors are a major force to contend with. But that's the basic gist of the Kanichi and Sansom thesis. And because history textbooks are by necessity generalized, and because they are, you know, usually a couple decades behind the historiographical curve, I'm willing to bet this is an explanation a lot of you are probably, to a degree, familiar with. Kaneichi and Sansom, though, oversimplify this. So, moving forward, we have a key group of samurai scholars. John Hall, Jeffrey Mass, Neil Kiley, Cameron Hurst, Bruce Batten, and Peter Arnson, among others. Of these guys, John Hall is arguably one of the most important, and we're going to talk about him in much later videos. But Hall's thesis for what I want to talk about right here in this video, for the origins of the samurai, when John Whitney Hall starts looking at ancient Japanese history and the origins of the samurai, he writes this book in about 1960, Government and Local Power in Japan, and he modifies the Kaneichi and Sansom thesis. So basically what his argument is, is that, well, the Richerier military is short-lived. The conscription thing doesn't work because these are peasant soldiers, they're not really professionally trained, but the court does not abandon all interest in the provinces. They're not entirely disinterested from what's going on in Japan. The growth of private power, so, you know, samurai holdings, is, according to Hall, a return to the pre Richeryu, the pre-Chinese way of doing things in Japan. And the key, I guess, social unit here, the, the key uh, building block of all this, is the EA, the Japanese familial unit. So specifically, in terms of Hall's idea, the EA refers to just the samurai, the samurai household. It's something that we're going to be talking about a lot in this series. It's something that's incredibly important, not only to the development of the samurai as a class, well, not really a class, as a status group in Japanese society, but also to the development of the samurai honor culture. And the core base of the EA is... Well, they're mercenaries. So, according to Hall, hired warriors result in the integration of local EA, local samurai households, into the court system. That's basically where he pushes this thing into the 1960s. So, from people like Hall and Mass and Kylie and Hurst and Batten and Arnson, among many others, the origins of the samurai grow increasingly complex. It's not necessarily that they're just hired swords from the, you know, desire of the nobility to protect their own land. That's very much a part of it, but it's not the full story. One of the key interventions here later on, specifically in 1992, is Carl Friday's Hired Swords, the rise of private warrior power in early Japan. So, there was this whole thing throughout the 60s, 70s, and 80s of, well, warrior power is increasing, Court power is slowly decreasing. Does that mean the imperial court has an active, vested interest in the governing of Japan and they just kind of lost out, or are they just not interested at all? Carl Friday made it very, very clear in his reevaluation of early documents that warriors don't just arise from court in action. Yeah, to an extent it happens, but the decline of the conscription military and the rise of private hired warrior bands was an intentional policy. It was an intentional, uh, I guess, experimentation with Japan's military done by the court. So the court has an active interest in the samurai. Eventually, they lose control. But initially, they're very much interested in hiring these violent people. So just as a recap, you know, as time moves on, the reliance on private power increases. The reliance on these people that come to be known as the samurai goes up, and the reliance on the National Conscription Army, because it's ineffective, decreases. Everything we've talked about so far, though, the idea that the samurai are hired swords to replace a national military that wasn't really working, the idea that samurai were hired to, uh, you know, protect the estates and the lands of the nobility, that kind of thing, every explanation, and even the Western analog theory, this idea that samurai are comparable to knights, 
is, I guess, predicated on an agricultural explanation, this idea that samurai are inherently tied to the land. Well, in about 1995, another book was published, The Taming of the Samurai, Honorific Individualism and the Making of Modern Japan. And in that book, the origins of the samurai and our understanding for how these people develop once again shifts, and it pushes the discussion away from the agricultural origins. What that book's argument is, and this is pretty much where the understanding now stands, is that the samurai, yeah, to an extent, some of them were tied to the land, to an extent, the agricultural origin idea is valid, but the vast majority of the samurai are non-agricultural, they are not tied to the land. So, how does this work? Well, when the buke break off from the kuge, so the kuge, once again, are the, you know, uh, civil aristocracy. These are the people in Kyoto that are much more concerned with culture, not really military affairs. They have too many kids. Eh, what do you do to prevent a succession dispute where you break off a chunk of that family? Send them out into Japan to fight and be warriors. This is where we get the bouquet from, the military houses. These people don't necessarily go out there to fight and protect the land with an army. You have to hire people. So yeah, on the one hand, it's like, well, you hire landed people, so the agricultural idea. But folklore and mythology and other stories from the early 600s to 700s, 800s, 900s, that era, tells us something much different. There's tons of folklore and tons of mythology and other stories that fit into broad genres like that which tell of outsiders coming into Japanese society to cut through the social fabric and use illegitimate violence legitimately. That is, their use of violence, their ability to kill, has been sanctioned by the court and by the state. And they cut through the social fabric, they cut through all this nonsense that small-town village life has going on, and they seize power. They order the countryside. Well, who are these people that are coming in? These are people um, that are bandits that have been hired. These are murderers. These are criminals that have been hired by the buke to kind of fight with them. These are hunters. These are uh, fishermen. So these are people that know the forests. They know the waterways. They know rivers. They know the cave systems. They know mountains. Stuff like that. These are like, the actual outcasts, the actual outsiders, extremely violent people that the military houses are hiring to help them pacify Eastern Japan, to help them impose order on a countryside that is very much, it's not lawless so much as the Japanese road system in this period is not really great, so like the conscription army and even the early samurai, the people that have been hired from the land, can't really reach these like backwoods areas that the buke and thus the court need to control and need to exert influence in. But these violent people out in the hills, the hunters, the bandits, the fishermen, trappers, those guys, they can. And these people are not afraid to use violence and to use force against people that need it used against them. They're not afraid to be legitimate in their use of violence. So, what the Taming of the Samurai does is it looks at Japanese folklore, it looks at Japanese mythology, and it says, well, a lot of the stuff that's in these stories is outsiders being brought in to impose order. So, the basic understanding now for where the Samurai have their origins is, yeah, a tiny, tiny part is the agricultural thing, they're tied to the land, but the vast majority of these people who become the early samurai are criminals, or murderers, or violent people, hunters, fishers, trappers, that sort of thing. They're brought into the buke, they're brought into the military houses, specifically because they're not afraid to get their hands dirty, they're very okay with using violence against other people, and now that the court has told them it's okay to do this, the use of violence is now legitimate. So, we have the samurai origins in the use of violent people to do what the court cannot. That's where the samurai come from as of right now. This could literally change in like 20 years if further research is done. 
but as of right now, the samurai are outsiders who are brought into the social fabric. This would be, in the modern day, I guess, an, an equivalent of, like, using criminals and murderers to do things that police and the military cannot, because laws forbid them from doing it. But those people, the violent individuals, have no qualms about doing this stuff. And this makes perfect sense, and we see this even later on, because the Minamoto are based on hunters. They have hunters all throughout their ranks. The Taira clan, this great samurai family that kind of seizes control in the 1100s, gets their start by crushing pirates in the inland sea, in the Sea of Japan. Well, to do that, you need people that know the waterways. You need fishermen. So they were hired and brought into the Taira family. In the 1100s, in the 1200s, after the samurai fully take over, more or less, and the Minamoto Bakufu is, you know, set up. That is, the uh, Kamakura Bakufu. Many of the samurai have manhood ceremonies based on hunting. You are not considered the man until you take your first kill in a hunt. You use hunting to demonstrate your martial skill. So that kind of thing all points back to this idea that samurai are, and I realize I'm repeating myself here, but I cannot stress enough how important this is, that the samurai are outsiders who are brought into the Japanese realm. They're brought into the Japanese sphere of influence to do what the court and the military can't. Eventually, they take full control. So, with that being said, let's do a brief summary. The Western analog theory of medieval Europe is comparable to medieval Japan, knights equal samurai, that sort of thing. Uh, it's basically rejected because it's too simplified, and you're looking at two completely different areas and trying to find far too many, uh, I guess, comparisons than there really are. There are more differences than similarities. And the core of the historiographical debate, the role of the court still is not fully certain. Is it active involvement? Is it hands-off? The idea of private warriors, even the hiring of violent people like hunters and trappers and criminals, is it new? Or is it a push back to the pre-Chinese way of doing things in Japan? The rise of warriors, how, how comparable is this to the decline of the court? Does one cause the other? It's still not fully certain. Yeah, Carl Friday's idea has pushed us more towards the idea that the court had an active role in things, but it's still not entirely certain. What I want you all to get out of this, though, is that samurai identity evolves very, very gradually. But by about 1200, we have this idea that the samurai are a distinct social group, governed by an honor culture, something created to, I guess, tame warriors, to tame violent individuals so they're not too violent to the Japanese people themselves. All this develops by 1200. So, with that being said, if you guys have any questions, I will see you in the comments. And if you want a deep dive into all this stuff, please check out the bibliography I've listed below in the description. It should give you a decent summary of everything that's currently going on in this field. So, I will see you all next time.